Today we are going to Kitt Peak, where our viewer friend Andrew works, and he's going to give us some behind-the-scenes look at some of the telescopes at the National Observatory. There's snow out the window, and there's snow on the road, look, in Arizona. This is Andrew. He works here at the observatory and he's going to show us around today. This is one of the things I like about the observatory here. It's the, it's public and anybody can come up. This is Bob Akivri. It's the origin of the universe of the Tona Oatum, uh, the folks who own the land that the observatory operates on. And if they had meridians, that would be their prime meridian. Part of their creation myth is that uh, they emerged from that rock tower over there and uh, that is uh, how they came into the world. You see that fork up at the top? There's like this, this thing that's kind of shaped like this, uh -huh. and it's got a round thing in the center of it. Yeah. That's the main mirror, and that's what tracks the sun. And then what it does is it reflects an image of the sun down this very long tube that even goes underground. They do that so they can get high magnification and image fidelity of the sun. They learned lessons on it, and they built another one very much like it in New Mexico, uh, what were they applied all the lessons learned for this one? So there's a primary mirror up there. And you see this is the tube for the image to travel down. And then they can they can they can change the focal length by moving it and bouncing it across any of these many mirrors you see on these trucks. And if you look down below us, you'll see one of the viewing ports. The unevenness of the air causes the image to distort a lot. You know, like when you look at something in the distance on a hot day or close to the road, you see those distortions. The same thing happened here. And it affects the overall maximum resolution of the system. And uh, they found out that that dominated over the quality of the optics. And they didn't understand that that was going to happen until, until it was built and operated. So you see what they have to do in New Mexico? All these wires, all these trucks with all these mirrors on them, they all had to be encapsulated inside a vacuum chamber. So we were here when we were in the visitor center, and you can see how far underground the main axis goes. And then it comes back up, and they've got various pickoff mirrors along the main axis to throw it down into the various instrumentation rooms. Uh, this is the main instrumentation room, so this is where the images uh, of the sun come down and are projected onto uh, various sensors, anything from a piece of paper to, you know, a camera that costs many hundreds of thousands of dollars. Here you can see the instrumentation that they've been using at this site. Oh, I'm looking at some of this stuff. That's from the 60s and 70s. <laughs> That's from the 80s right there, that cart. Yeah, things don't die in astronomy. We just keep using it until it's no longer useful. It almost really became a fashion statement in astronomy that you've got to put your telescope inside a dome. It's actually it looks the futuristic and cool. Well, you know, they thought that there was some utility to it, but the reality is it really screws up the air currents around the telescopes, mm -hmm. and it causes them to perform uh, very poorly than, than what they could otherwise. What you really want is a structure that would hug the telescope to protect it by day, open up at night, and expose the entire telescope to the environment around it. And you want to air condition the telescope so that it tracks the temperature outside, so that when you open, it's at the same temperature. Check out the 50s artwork. Yes. You let it stick around long enough that it comes back in style. <laughs> that stuff's pretty hip right now. Yeah. And this instrument is not unique, but it's it's a little bit more than just just a telescope that you look through. Uh, it's also it's used primarily for spectroscopy. So you want to not only see something, but you want to find out what's in it. And so you take the light that's coming off the object and you split it up, right? Just like on the cover of that Pink Floyd album, right? Where <laughs> white light goes in and all the colors come out. Um, well, you do that, when you do that, you get absorption lines or emission lines. And based on those absorptions and emissions, you can tell what's inside the object. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah, that's how we actually know 
That's how we know the elemental composition of stars. So with spacecraft being able to go and collect physical samples, like, has it revealed a lot more? Like, did, did they find that anything they thought was inaccurate, or it just gives them more information? It gives more information, and for the most part, it's been verified. I, I, I don't know of any, you know, things where, oh, you know, the spectra were wrong, you know. It's just, you know, now we know to a much higher degree. And, you know, the plant that we've seen, what have we dug on? We've dug on Venus, we've dug on the moon. We've dug on Mars, so we haven't, you know, sent, we sent landers to Saturn's moon Titan. Um, I don't think it tried to dig anything. I, I think it just uh, said, hey, I'm here, here's a picture. Man, it's cold. Smell the old science. Yes. This is the basics of uh, a telescope used for science. It's big. It's made out of very expensive, very high-grade steel and all you do is bolt stuff to it, year after year after year, and it never dies. How many people can enjoy this every day at work? That is pretty spectacular. Yeah. How many nights a month are you up here? I'm up here one week a month, so I spend a quarter of my life switching back and forth. Day schedule, night schedule, day schedule, night schedule. You better like it. This is a mechanical dummy for the four meter telescope mirror. Before they put the mirror in, when they wanted to balance the telescope, they made this uh, concrete dummy that weighs as much as the glass uh, in the telescope. The big dish is used for a type of observation called very large baseline interferometry. But what they'll do is they'll team up with telescopes all around the Earth, and they'll take simultaneous readings of the same object at the same time, but they're distributed over the diameter of the Earth. And what they'll do is they'll record those signals and then mathematically add them together in a computer and make it as if the telescope were as big as the Earth. And then they get even smarter than that. What they'll do is they'll use the orbital motion of the Earth around the star to do the very same thing, and then you get outrageously large baseline interferometries. So this is where we sleep and do our laundry, take our showers, and that's pretty much it. Watch TV when it rains. And we just got a flat screen after all these years. Nice. Oh, my oh yeah. Goodness. Oh, wait a minute. No, it, it may be broken. We may be back to the tube. We'll find out. <laughs> Nothing dies up here. Our budgets are small and our technical skills are high. I love your carpet. Yes. Look at that carpet. <laughs> is this kitsch or what? Yeah. Come storm time? How about that? Yeah. yeah that's got to be amazing. And I like this selection. You got some National Geographic. You got Geek Magazine. You know, some of them might even be 20th century. <laughs> <laughs> so this is where you would sleep when you're when you're not observing. Nice. Yeah. All right. Let's go see a let's go see a dome. This is the baby remote control. One meter diameter mirror. Point nine meters. Oldest telescope on the mountain. So is our industrial area here, so we've got air compressors, old parts of the telescope, and this is the pier that the telescope sits on. It's actually a building separate from the rest of the building. Hmm. That way the whole building can sway, but not uh, about the telescope. Interesting. This is the old, early 20th century telescope drive that you would use to drive the telescope against the Earth's rotation. So this is the 0.9 meter telescope. It's about 100 years old. Bits and pieces of it are definitely now 100 years old. The contract for the telescope was written in 1915, and work was started on it by the Warner and Swayze Company, but they were a telescope corporation as well as a machine tool company. When it was decided that the US was gonna start building up its armed forces, in preparation for entering World War I, the Warner and Swayze Company was ordered to halt work on this telescope. So it wasn't finished until 1921, but it was started in 1915. So technically, I consider this telescope to be 100 years old, but it definitely will be soon, you know, all the bits and pieces. So yeah, come on around and show you uh, some of the old systems and some of the modern systems. All the big equipment is original, 
All the modern equipment here has bolt, uh, been bolted on throughout the decades at various times in the late 20th century and now the 21st century. And this telescope will be used to recover anywhere from 30 to 50 asteroids per night or survey for uh, asteroids that have yet to be discovered. Come on up, I'll show you the camera. So this is a modern astronomical camera. So the camera that you're, that's taking my images right now is probably what, eight megapixels? Okay, so that's eight million pixels. Oh, this actually has 40 million pixels. So we've got a very large array of uh, CCDs and the CCDs are sitting in this area where you see where these wire cables are coming out here. Mm -hmm. Each of those is connected to a CCD. As we open up the camera and start taking an exposure, just the heat from the environment around it will cause false signals to appear on the detector and it'll swamp out uh, the signal that we're trying to pick up uh, from, uh, from the asteroids. So we remove that heat um, from those detectors with this liquid nitrogen. So what we do is we take this telescope, aim it at a portion of the sky, and then we go look someplace else, and then we come back, and we take another picture of the sky, then we go look someplace else, and then we come take a third picture. And what we do is we play an animation of those pictures, and we look for things, well we don't, the computers look for things that are moving. And then based on that motion, you'll say, well, I'm going to assume it's in a heliocentric orbit, so it's an orbit around the sun. So based on these observations and the assumption that it's an orbit around the sun, what kind of orbit is it in? And if it looks ridiculous, well, it's probably in orbit around the Earth, and then you'll compute a new orbit for it, and you'll promptly ignore it. Um, we're interested in things that are in orbit around the sun. So that's in essence what all these, uh, what, what, the, what an asteroid survey or asteroid recovery telescope is doing. And uh, I'll show you uh, some data that I took last night, and I'll show you that process of that, that looping of the animation. He's going to open up the dome for us. We'll get some good light in here. Okay, loud noise. How's that? That is awesome. Look at that garage door opener. I put that garage door opener in the summer. <laughs> I'm going to poke my head out there. You all know I'm scared of heights. Check this out. Oh my goodness. We are poking our head out of a giant dome for a telescope. Take your time coming down. Yeah. That's, That's a view right that there. That is cool. This is the dark room where all the photographic plates or film that would have been taken on the camera would be developed. And we still use it as a sort of dark room. These are the image processing computers that we use for what we do. Now you'll notice here that we, we name our computers white, pale, red, and black. And those are the four horsemen of the apocalypse <laughs> as we keep in mind just what it is that pays the bills. <laughs> Nobody sits in here anymore. But this is, this is actually where I first started uh, uh, controlling telescopes to do astronomy. And this is the most comfortable control room that I've ever, ever had. I, I, I miss it very much, but we run everything automatically and uh, so nobody sits in here anymore. It's kind of a good thing because these two things sound like jet engines. <laughs> but, um, is this the phone that Commissioner Gordon calls you on? This is the phone that Commissioner Gordon calls me on. So, here's where I live. Cool. That is a lot of monitors. It is a lot of monitors, and they're all being used for something. Telescope amplifiers here. Data processing computers here. Show you the telescope. Oh, sweet. Steep ladder. So the Air Force was going to build these space stations, right? They were called manned orbiting laboratories. And they were going to have uh, two meter mirrors on them. And they were going to have two astronauts inside the space station. And their job would be to 
do the equivalent of looking through a pair of binoculars and say, I want a close-up picture of that, right? And then they would, they would orient the space station, which was a, a space telescope, and take a picture of something on the ground. And then they would telemeter it to the ground, right? It was a spy satellite. Well, this is one of those mirrors. It was meant to go up on one of those space stations. It's kind of fun when I run this thing, I picture myself as being in my own little manned non-orbiting lab yeah. you know, where I'm using the, using the telescope to look out instead of look down, but it's still got a quasi-defense mission. You know, you're, you're still long-term protecting you know, the Earth from uh, you know, some object that might hit us many tens or hundreds of years from now. It's an old spy satellite. Your air traffic control for rocks. Not control. We're just detecting. <laughs> we can't control yet. There we go. That's a problem for our grandkids. There we go. See, all that getting on and off the airstream roof was just practice. Let's take a look at some asteroids. So what we're doing here is we're recovering asteroids that are already known. We're looking at them again. We want to we wanna take measurements on them to refine the orbits. Let's go for this point of the night when the scene was really good. Uh, by the way, those are satellites going by. Oh, cool. Yeah. How do they prevent them from crashing into each other from time Space to time? Space is very, 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 very big. And satellites, in comparison, are very, very, very small. Uh, the so chances, the chances of them hitting is nothing. It's, it is literally astronomically small. <laughs> Here's those three images I was telling you telling you about that loop of three images yeah so you see this star is not moving right that star is not moving that galaxy is not moving but here's this little dot and yeah. you see a move mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that's an asteroid so here was the predicted position of the of the asteroid here's the real position of the asteroid right so you see it differs so that means your model's a little bit off models a little bit off so the more we observe these objects the closer those will be to come uh, into these setting circles as we get to know the orbit better. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's, uh, that's why we're observing these things. So I'll show you what a observation comes down to. All this, this building, the telescope, the camera, all the support electronics <laughs> and the computers, it gets reduced down to this. And that's what goes into the archives. And that's what gets used to, uh, to uh, generate the orbits. Well, we want to thank Andrew so much for showing us around. It, it has been something really, really different for us to see. And we hope that you guys have enjoyed it as much as we have. Hope you enjoyed it. And thank you for your videos. I enjoy them.